Doctor, we know there are variants between various ed- printed editions of the Texas Receptus. So my question is, how do you personally respond to some of these variants, or I should say some of these uncertainties? And do you leave them or, or do you try to resolve them? Let me go back to <clears throat> Peter Van Cleek Sr. Because I think it's really important to define what we mean by preservation. Again, in his recent book, which is an exegetical grounding for a standard sacred text, he gives a definition at one point of preservation. He, he wrote, the certain trajectory within history keeps keeping and maintaining the inspired words continuity with the exemplar. We would readily confess, I think I would certainly, that mm-hmm. there is some mystery from our perspective, given that we're not God, right. how the Lord chose the means that he used to preserve his word across the ages. Van Cleek similarly notes that God's preservation of scripture, as he puts it, cannot be programmed, it cannot be categorized, it cannot be easily referenced. Right. But he says, uh, in an interesting turn of phrase, he says there is evidence of what he calls an algorithm of divine proportion, according okay. to the good okay. pleasure of God, and he says, therefore, this process of preservation is beyond the scope of human genius and ingenuity. And I think that's a good way of putting it. I think at this point, though, we have to make an important clarification. Those who hold to the confessional text believe that the received text is the word of God. So the received text is the Bible. So the real question is not the question, is the TR tradition pure? The real question is not, did God preserve the TR in every jot and tittle? The real questions are, is the Bible pure? Is every word in the Bible pure? Did God preserve the Bible in every jot and tittle. We got to be clear about what we're really talking about. We're we're really talking about, is the Bible perfect? Is the Bible pure? Is every inspired word of the Bible, has it been kept pure in all ages? And I believe that God has preserved his word. I think if he has not preserved his word down to the jot and tittle, we have absolutely no epistemic foundation for Christianity. We're facing a huge problem right now in the early 20th first century. We have people basically from our own camp that are digging away at the authority of the Bible. And what we're seeing is, first of all, we're seeing a lot of people are just leaving Christianity because they see no basis of authority within it, period. We see people leaving evangelicals and Protestants, and many of them are going to swimming the Tiber and becoming Roman Catholic because the magisterium will tell them. Or they're going to Eastern Orthodoxy, where the church fathers, or the church councils will tell them this. Mm -hmm. Well, the distinctive thing about Protestantism has always been the, the centrality of the scriptures. Right. And so if the scriptures have not been providentially preserved by God, we have no basis of authority. We have no epistemic foundation for the faith. And so I think this is a really, really, really important issue. You asked me how I respond to some of these, didn't you call them uncertainties? Is that the yeah, word you Yeah, uncertainties or variants, or I, I would you, use them interchangeably. And you asked, yeah. do, I, do I leave them or do I try to resolve them? So first of all, I don't feel in the least overwhelmed with any uncertainty uncertainty about the word of God. I believe we have it in the received text. I'm not mm, nervous. Right, right, right. right. I'm I'm not filled with a lot. I'm sure that'll be clipped in there somewhere. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not filled with great uncertainty about the word of God. Practically speaking, when I, as a pastor, when I uh, was a Christian, when I sit down out and privilege to be able to read the Bible in the original languages, as a pastor, if I'm, as I'm preaching Lord's Day by Lord's Day, and I do my exegesis of the text before I preach as preparation for preaching, what I do is I reach for Scrivener's Greek New Testament printed right. by the Darian Bible Society. Right. It's right. erudite. It's a scholarly representation of the mature Protestant printed editions of the TR. It largely follows the last edition that was printed during Beza's life, Theodore Beza's mm-hmm. life. It differs from the text of Beza in several places. And I actually also have a Cambridge edition Uh, from 1949 that lists all those places where Scrivener departs 
uh, from Bayes's uh, last printed edition. TBS, the TBS edition doesn't print those, but I have the Cambridge edition that does. So it's not like I'm sitting around, oh my goodness, I've got to prepare a sermon. I've got to get Stefanos' 1550 and I got right, to get, right. I've got to, you know, get online and see if I can find Erasmus or whatever. No. I have a, a perfectly good printed edition, contemporary printed edition of the TR that I can reach for and that I can read. So you just, uh, you pull Scrivener off the shelf and, and that's it. You, you don't do any other work. That That's like your text, right? When I say your text, I mean the text that you use and, yeah. and you consider that to be God's Ab word. Absolutely. Now, yeah. I'm probably not the average person who's using it because I have a little right. bit more training sure. and I've spent more time than some people, other people have in studying this. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I can go, I can look for through and I can look through the places where there are differences. And, you know, I, I looked today just pre preparing for this and the yeah. very first, the very first difference that's listed is in Matthew 1, 8 in the genealogy and the differences in the genealogy, it lists in Christ's genealogy, King Uzziah. And in uh, Scrivener, it's spelled Ozias, right. the final sigma. In that Cambridge edition, he notes that that's actually a spelling that departs from Beza. He chooses to, to depart there. The spelling in Beza was Ozion. It's a matter of spelling this name, Uzziah. I think that Scrivener makes the right choice on that. And so that's just one example. That also That's also an example of what the level of many of these differences in the right, TRR. Right. Yeah, are. and I, I've had a chance to take a look at, so I think there was listed 190 or 197. Uh, somewhere around there. Nick Sayers has done a, a video series recently. Yeah. yeah. And he's he's uh, taking a look at some of these uh, variants. Haven't had a chance to look at them, but yeah, I, yeah. I know the lists are out there and then you can check it out. And I know for the most part, they're they're relatively minor. There might be a few that actually make some changes in meaning, but it, I, I mean, you and you and I would agree that it's nowhere near uh, the, I would say the mess we have in the critical text. Well, I mean, it just illustrates that we can talk more about this, you know, that, that certain persons have uh, thrown forward the so-called witch TR object. Mm -hmm. And it's really not, it may sound like to somebody who's outside and uninformed, like a, I think a serious challenge, but I think practically speaking, it's really not. Mm -hmm. Scrivener's is the standard printed edition of the TR that's in use in our day. It coheres with the classic English translation of the Bible and many other Protestant, classic Protestant translations of the Bible. Really, the only time that I'm going to look and compare is typically when I meet with objections from people who are challenging the authenticity of the text. My friend R.L. Vaughn has pointed out the which TR objection or question is really not a question of fact. What he says is it's not a question of fact. But the witch TR objection is really what he calls a stratagem of debate. It's an attempt to undermine person's confidence in the TR as the preserved uh, text of the New Testament. I had someone email me, and this happens pretty frequently, but just uh, last week, someone emailed me and they said, Pastor Riddle, isn't what you do as a TR advocate comparing the differences in the printed TR editions, isn't that really no different than what modern scholars who are doing who use the, the modern economy? eclectic method. You're just limiting it to the print edition, the TR, whereas they're saying, you know, we're using all the extant Greek manuscripts and the, the early versions and everything else. He, here's what I wrote in response to, to this person. Yeah, sure. Part. With a little bit of editing. I said to him in the end, in essence, I don't buy that those who advocate for the modern critical text and I have the same method. We don't have the same method. Here's why. Our method, the TR position has a fixed text. It's a stable text. Their method has a text that is not fixed and will never be fixed. Their text will always be open to new discoveries. They don't have a single verse in the Bible that is settled. This came out in my debate with, with James White when I asked right. him, can you show me one verse that you think is, is beyond question? In the end, he could not name a single verse. Every single verse in the Bible for somebody who embraces the modern 
critical text and its method, the eclectic method. It's subject to change. Mm -hmm. There may be a discovery in the Judean desert. There may be a new algorithm or a new method. There may be a decision that some early version or translation actually holds the true text, even though we don't have an extant Greek manuscript right. for it. Their text is perennially open to change and it's open to radical change. Now they mm -hmm. will often tell you it's highly unlikely that any significant finds will be discovered that will alter the text basically as it is, but simply theoretically, methodologically to embrace their position means that really there's no verse in the Bible that might not be changed or altered in future editions of the modern critical text. Furthermore, this we're different in that we accept the authenticity of passages like the traditional ending of Mark, Mark yes. 16, yep. 9 through 20. We accept the pericope adulteri, the woman taken in adultery, John 7, mm -hmm. 53 through 8, 11. Mm -hmm. If you hold to the modern critical text position, you're going to have That's in so the Nesselon 28th edition, they're put in brackets, but That's right. you go to the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, they completely remove the Pericope Adulteri right. from the text, as does the 2010 SBL Greek New Testament. We're not talking about the same methodology here. No, so no. Let's, let's not pretend that we're operating in the same sort of way, and there's not really much of a difference between the way we're approaching the text and the way are. And I think here's another thing that's really, really significant. We believe that we have the word of God. We believe that we have access to the autographs. We have access to the divine original, as someone like John Owen would have put it. They, on the other hand, have embraced a method that no longer sees it as tenable to reconstruct or ascertain the original. And I know right. you had this conversation and you asked them to pledge. So would you guys uh, go on record Go on record and, and say that you are concerned with finding the original text. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I pointed out that they, they seem to say uh, one thing, but then they write something else. In the scholarly guild, they no longer talk about trying to restore the autograph. Show me one mainstream scholar in the 21st century who's written an essay or article saying that he has restored the autograph for a particular passage. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen. The term they use is the initial text or the right. outscape. The initial text is the text as far back as we think we can reconstruct it. Right, right. And yes, there might be some people who say, perhaps this is the authorial text. But I'm just telling you, methodologically, that's not the same thing. That's mm -hmm. not the same as saying, we believe God has preserved his word in every jot and tittle, and we have it in the TR tradition. We have it in uh, the TR. Anyways, I think that we shouldn't say, oh, you know, we're basically doing the same thing. We're not doing the same. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because the the word textual criticism uh, is is kind of general, and then depending on the types of principles you use, will determine what flavor of textual criticism you use. So technically, if you make a decision between two readings, you're doing textual criticism. But the the question is is what are your underlying convictions and what are your underlying principles.